curious what comes to mind when I say the word worship. I know it creates something in our minds. We're going to be talking about that for the next several weeks. And so just just kind of what picture does that create in your minds? Now, some of you it might create a picture of a, a you know a priest maybe wearing a, you know some robes, uh, you know kind of ornate stuff. I'm not sure what all that stuff is called. I should know, but I don't. And uh, people, you know, in, in lighting candles and icons and things like that around. That may be the picture that it creates in your mind. Uh, you may have a picture of a bunch of people sitting in a church being really bored and trying to stay awake. That may be your picture of worship. I'm not sure. Your, your picture of worship may be people dancing around. You know, they got handkerchiefs and flags and maybe people are falling on the ground. And there's all kinds of interesting things going on. Maybe that's your picture of worship. Maybe when I say worship, it's something completely different for you. Maybe it's uh, you know a jungle tribe in, in Africa somewhere, and you know some natives doing some kind of ritual that involves you know blood of some sort and some kind of crazy. Maybe there's a pot and a bowling something, and and that's kind of and people are dancing around, and that's your picture of worship. I don't know what your picture is, uh, but it always creates some kind of picture. In our minds, for a lot of us, what worship, what we think of when somebody says worship, we think music, we think playing music, we think singing songs. So we're going to talk about that, you know, because maybe you're not really sure what is worship. Because um, for a lot of us, it's kind of mysterious. It's kind of this word that we say a lot, we use it, we name things like these are our worship services. You know, come worship with us. You know, um, you know, you know, worship music worship you know we, we throw that word around a lot but sometimes it can be kind of mysterious as to what it really what it really is what it really means you know what do we how do we really do this um how many of you know what the choke on a car is like a, the choke for an engine so some of you know um I, there's not gonna be a quiz i'm not gonna ask you to explain it to me because i can barely explain it myself but I, I didn't know what a choke was. I kind of I had seen a choke growing up. None of the cars I actually drove when I was growing up had a choke on them. We were kind of past that stage uh, by the time I started driving. But I remember my grandpa's truck had a choke. But it's just a vague memory, not anything I really ever thought much about until I bought my first Russian car. When we came in 1997, uh, we were here for about six months and we bought a Russian uh, Lada Zhigoli, a little white station wagon, beautiful car. I still have fond memories of it. Um, and I remember this thing cost me, the exchange rate back then was, you know, in the thousands of rubles per dollar. I don't remember exactly what it was, 6,000 or more. It may have been up to like 15, 20,000. I don't remember. But I remember when I exchanged my $6,000 that I used to buy this car, I had two stacks of cash this high. 
And like they gave it to me at the bank and I had to walk like a mile to the place where I was buying the car. I'm like, somebody's going to kill me on the way. You know, I'm like stuffing this stuff in my coat, you know, and trying to, you know, look like I don't have millions of ruples on me. Um, I remember I was very glad just to get rid of the money and get the car. But I had somebody else drive it home. I wasn't really familiar with using a stick shift that much either at the time. Uh, I was pampered, automatic transmission. So I, when, when I... You know, the guy brought it home for me, parked it. The next day was Saturday. I decided I'm going to go out and drive it when there's no traffic. So I went out in the morning. I started trying to start the thing. I was starting, start. I just would not, nothing. I tried everything. I mean, I've started cars for a long time, but I could not get this thing started. It was so frustrating. And I noticed there was this guy, kind of looked like he had, was probably, you know, a little hungover from the night before. He was stumbling around. And he, was, he would walk by the car, and he would look at me, look in the window. And then he would walk by again. You know, a little bit later, I'm still, mm -hmm, I'm like watching this guy, and he'd walk by again. And he did this like 10 times. He's walking by the car. And finally, and I'm just getting really frustrated. He walks up, peck, 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 peck on the window. I'm like, what does this guy want? I rolled down the window. I hadn't been here long enough to speak really hardly any Russian. I didn't at least know what this guy was saying. And he was like jabbering on about something. And I didn't know what. I'm like, I don't have time for this, man. I'm trying to get my car started. I don't understand you. Please leave me alone. And I could tell he was trying to tell me something. And finally, he just reached in the car past me, grabbed this knob, and pulled it out. And it was like, try it again. I'm like, okay. Boom, started right up. I'm like, what is this magical knob? I don't know what this thing is, but it is incredible. And so then I researched a little bit, asked around, and found out it's a choke. I was like, oh, I've heard of one of those before. Like, uh, you know, my grandpa had one. I've never actually seen one before. So I like studied how they work. This thing was incredible. My car, it didn't matter, 20, 30, 40 below, I could start my car just like that in any kind of weather. It was amazing. It was just amazing the power of the knob. You know, I was like, this is incredible. And I had this the whole time, and I never understood what it, what it was until that guy came along and just like, hey, pull this thing out. And then I suddenly discovered it. Worship is like that for a lot of us. We have it at our disposal. There's incredible power in it. And we don't even realize it. Sometimes we don't really even understand what kind of power we have. We, we just, we, we let it. Uh, we let it go unused. And what worship is, is this fire that ignites everything we do in our Christian life. Really, everything kind of starts with worship. If you think about it, evangelism starts with worship. Bible study starts with worship. Uh, prayer starts with worship. Mission work starts with worship. Love, patience, kindness, all of these things begin with worship. None of them get started without it. If you're not worshiping, if you're not worshiping God, you're not going to tell anybody else about him. If you're not worshiping God, then you're not going to be thinking, I need to get into his word and study and find out some more about him and what he wants from me. If you're not worshiping God, you're not going to be excited to pray. You're not going to be excited to do anything in the Christian life. It all begins with worship. Worship excites us to do the things that God has called us to do. In your engine, there's this, just to tell you how a choke works. Forgive me if I'm explaining this wrong. But basically what a choke does, it, it chokes out the, the oxygen, that is the air that's getting into your, your engine. Crank me down just a little bit. I, I feel like I'm really, really hot. It, it, it chokes out a little bit of the air in the engine. And what that does is it makes the fuel and air mixture much richer. You get more fuel in a hotter fire and things start much easier. That's the same thing that that worship does for us. It increases this fire that's in us. It lights a fire and causes an explosion that gives us the passion to do the things that God has called us to do. Worship is absolutely key to living for Christ. It is absolutely key for us to do the things that we need to as a church. It is absolutely key for you as, a, as, as an individual, maybe as a, as a husband, as a wife, as a, as a child, as a student. Wh whatever your role is in life, worship is the absolute 
first step that you need to take to truly be able to do the things that God is calling you to do. Foundational thing right here. But worship can be really mysterious to us. So this, that's what I want to, want to do in this series. I want to take some of the mystery out of it. We're just going to dive into it. We're going to look at some different uh, aspects of worship, what some words mean. We're going to look at some examples, Old and New Testament, just what the Bible says about worship, and just kind of figure out what is this thing that we're talking about. How do you do it? What's my role in this? How am I supposed to be involved in worship? Let me just start off with this today, though. Very simple thing, the definition of worship. This is my definition. It's a, a quite simplified definition, but, I, but this is going to be our working definition right up here. Bring that up that first slide. Worship is meeting with God and giving Him glory. Meeting with God and giving Him glory. That should be what we do on Sundays, but it shouldn't just be on Sundays. But it should be what we came here to do today, to meet with God and to give Him glory. That's what worship is all about. When we, uh, you know, when we glorify something else, when we worship something else other than God, basically what we're doing is we're we're connecting with that other thing and we're giving it glory. God has called us to give Him worship, to meet with Him, and to give Him glory. And there's a lot packed into the, that statement. How do we meet with God? How do we do that? How does that even happen? How how do we give Him glory? What happens when we meet with God? There's all these things that that go into that. And in this series, we're going to look at that and, and look at worship in the Bible and, and see what's going on there and see how it's done and how what's necessary to have right worship in, in our lives and in our church. But today, I just want to start off by establishing this, that worship is important and worship is something that every single believer in Christ should be involved in. Worship is something that every believer every follower of jesus christ you all have a part to play in this thing called worship what are we doing i i, I love to worship personally i love i love music that's one of the ways that i worship it's one expression of worship and i i love when maybe there's a song that i connect with sometimes it's a message sometimes it's just i love to sit and listen to preaching I love to listen to great music that, that preaches to me and that, that shares God's word and speaks God's word into my life. Because there are times when things just click. Sometimes I'm distracted, but there are times when things just click. And I understand that God, God is present. God is there. And I understand that he's speaking to me. And I understand that, that I'm in his presence. And, and it's, it's, it's overwhelming. I love to experience that. I love to know that I'm in the presence of God. I love being reminded of that. I love when worship takes place and it just and, and my mind focuses in on Him and I meet with Him and I give Him glory. Sometimes it, it's a little scary to me because my, my first reaction is usually I want to cry, which is really, really strange, you know? And I'm like, wow, I'm like so emotional right now. And, and then somebody always wants to talk to me. And they're like, are you okay? I'm like, okay, just give me a second. Okay, I'm okay. It's all good. But sometimes just the, the glory of God just is really overwhelming. I love that experience. And I want our church to experience that. I want you to experience that. I want every one of us to be immersed in worship. And, and, and I, just, I just want to share what I've experienced with other people. It's kind of like... Um, when uh, you discover some new delicious food, have you ever discovered something that's just, may, maybe for you, this, it's a little like worship. You know, you bite into something, you're like, this is incredible. Like, have you ever just like been enraptured by food? Am I the only one? Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> if it's got bacon on it, that's certainly a plus. It's moving in the right direction. Um, you know, for me, it's usually like some burger. I just had, a, we had a burger at City Girl the other day, the Black Jack Burger. And it, it was, it was it going the right direction. I wouldn't say I was enraptured by it, but it was certainly good. I would, it's one of those things when you, when you bite into something really good, and this is exactly what I did. I bit into it, and I'm like, whoa, man, this is so good. There's all kinds of crazy, magical stuff happening in your mouth, and you're, you're just like experiencing all kinds of <laughs> sensation. And it's glorious. And your first, at least my first instinct is, to stick it in somebody else's face and say, try this. Like, you've gotten, like, Lisa, she's sitting somewhere close by. I'm like, 
you've got to try this. And she's like eating something else completely. I'm like, just swallow that, spit it out. I don't care. <laughs> Put this into your mouth and eat it. It is incredible. Whatever it is, you know, maybe it's like cheesecake or something, which is usually the other way around. Lisa's the one eating cheesecake, sticking it into my face. But it's like, you just scoop it up and like, you have got to try this. This is incredible. I experienced this. I want you to experience it. That's kind of how I feel about worship. You've got to try this. Um, you know, everyone needs to experience worship. Maybe not everybody needs to experience the blackjack hamburger. Not everybody needs to experience cheesecake. You probably do, but maybe you don't. I'm not 100% on that. But worship, you definitely need to experience that. Everyone needs to experience it because God is worthy of our worship. Listen uh, to these words again. Psalm 90. Um, what, do we, what do we read this morning? I didn't read it. Okay, we didn't read it? Okay. 95, 1 through 7. I was, I was uh, getting a cup of tea. So. Um, Psalm 95. Let's read this. You got it up there? Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him. Listen to these let us. This, well, this is the things we need to do. Let us sing for joy. Let us shout aloud. Let us come before him with thanksgiving, verse 2. And extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care, today if only you would hear his voice. Man, that is, some, that is a powerful song right there. Th those are powerful, powerful words. We worship God. Listen to this. We worship God because of who he is and what he's done for us. Because of who he is and because of who we are in relationship to him. Listen to this. You know, worship is an, is an expression of our relationship to God. It, it's, you know... He, he's not some distant God that we can never know. Uh, he, he's part of our lives. Worship should, should flow out of that relationship that we have with him. Worship should just be something naturally flowing out of that. Listen to what he says here. He is our shepherd. We are his sheep. He is our king, and we are his subjects. He is our master, and we are his servants. He is the vine, it says in the New Testament, and we are the branches. All kinds of stuff like this, and all throughout the Bible, he in every way is worthy of our worship. He's worthy because of who he is. But sometimes we get confused. Um, we get confused about what worship is and, and who can do it. Um, so let me tell you a couple of things that worship is not, okay? Just to, just to clear these things off the table uh, so that we're not confused about these things anymore. Worship is not three songs in a sermon. I'm not saying that three songs in a sermon are, are bad. Um, there's, but there's nothing magical about that. And maybe you're like, I know it's two songs in a sermon. Three songs is way too much. Or maybe you're there like, I, I totally agree. We should do four. It's, it's not, there's nothing magical about the order of services. Why, why do we, we even do it that way? You ever wondered that? I, it's a simple answer because that's the way it's been done for centuries. Okay, It's tradition. We've just done it. We've always done it that way kind of thing. Um, and, and people have been doing that. And singing to God, great thing to do. I'm so glad we do it. <laughs> Learning God's word, opening that up and, and looking at what he's telling us, great thing to do. I'm so glad we do it. But that order of service, the, the, the way we, we do things, is not magical. That's not the definition of worship. These are ways that we express worship. And these are ways that we stimulate worship. I mean, that's why we, that's why we sing to hopefully, and it's, like I said, it stimulates worship in me sometimes. And, and that's why we, we open God's word because that stimulates worship in us as well. But these are not the definition of worship, which brings me to the second thing that worship is not. It's not something that only church leaders do. Okay. It's definitely not something only the pastor does or only the worship leader does or only some other leader in the church does. Um, you, you don't have to have a seminary degree to worship. You don't have to play a musical instrument or be a really great singer to worship. Okay, 
those aren't requirements. You don't have to know Greek and Hebrew. It's really cool if you do know Greek and Hebrew, right, Elena? It's, it's, it's nice to know those things. But it's not a requirement. Worship is something that all believers, young and old, men, women, boys, girls, all believers should be engaged in. We're all called to do this. It's not just something that you watch other people do. Worship is something that God has called you to do if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. I'll even take it a step further, okay? Here's where, here's where it starts getting a little, I'm, you know, stick your toes out. I'm going to step on them a little bit. Here, you ready? Not only are you called to be a worshiper, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you're called to be a leader of worship. Okay? Here's what we're going to look at in the Bible. 1 Peter 2, 4, 5, and, uh, 4, verses 4, 5, and 9. Okay, listen to what this says. First Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, and then we'll skip down to verse 9. As, as you come to him, the living stone, this is talking about Jesus Christ. This is talking about as you give your life to Jesus Christ, as you become a follower, as you become a believer, as you are saved, as you become a Christian, whatever word you want to use for it, listen to this. As you come to him, he, Jesus Christ, rejected by, uh, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, Jesus Christ is the answer. He is our salvation. As we come to him, it says this. You also, verse 5, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. You're being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. Who is that talking about? Believers. It's talking about followers of Jesus Christ. You are being built into a spiritual house to become a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Verse 9 says this, You are a chosen people. God chose you. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. That's you. You're a priest. If you're a follower of God, if you have Jesus Christ in your life, you are a priest. You are a leader of worship. As soon as you become a believer, you enter into this priesthood. This is how much God values you. This is how much God loves you. You were chosen. You were chosen as a priest. Do you believe that? Some of you are probably struggling to believe that. You're like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> that's that's kind of crazy. Has he gone off the edge with this one? I don't know. You are a priest. I mean, I'm just reading that straight out of the Bible. <clears throat> do you believe that? Here's what we're going to do. We're gonna, just going to kind of solidify this. I want you to say that here in just a second. I want you to say, I am a priest. If you're a believer right now, I want you to say that. I am. You're a priest. That is a truth. Say it one more time with a little bit more conviction. I am a priest. I'm a priest. Now, if one of you come up and like want to do the sermon next week, you know, I, I'm, I'll have to, you know, vet you a little bit, and maybe we'll, we'll talk about it. But you're a priest nonetheless, and that's amazing. It's amazing. It's an amazing truth in Scripture that sometimes we don't really grasp. We are leaders of worship. We are priests. God has made us priests, his representatives. God wants to use us. Now, sometimes when we hear that word use, we're like, whoa, 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 God wants to use me? Because normally when people use things, it's not really great, right? You know, when people use things, most of the time, when, th when something is used, what do you do with it after it's used? You toss it, right? You throw it away. You, you put it in the garbage. You throw it in the in, in the trash can. No, thanks, God. I don't think I want to be used. Appreciate it. I don't think so. That's kind of our reaction usually when God wants to use us because we know how used things end up. And we don't want to be a piece of chewing gum that gets all chewed up and all the flavor's gone and gets spit out somewhere. I, I don't want that for myself. No, thanks, God. I don't want to be used. But that's not how God uses us. God uses us like, you know those, you know those people um, that, that go around and they, they find junk? 
and you're looking at it going, that is total garbage, it's junk. And then they take it and they take it home and they fix it and they 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 they, they you know glue it back together and they paint it and then they hang it on your their wall and you're going, Wow, that is the most amazing thing I've ever seen in my life. I'll pay a thousand dollars for that. You know, and somebody comes along and buys it and you're like what just happened? That is total and complete trash. And they turned it into this beautiful work of art that somebody takes and puts on display in their home somewhere. Isn't that amazing? That's what God does with us. That's how he uses us. He takes us when we're broken and we're, we're shattered and we're torn apart and we're dirty. And he cleans us up and he, he, he puts us back together even better than before, and, 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 he, and he covers us, and he turns us into something beautiful, and he puts us on display as his priests. That's what God does with us. He wants to use us. That's how he feels about you. He wants to make this incredible work of art. And when we're broken down, he can take us and make us worthy of being priests, worthy of being on display, worthy of being his representatives. You know, some, uh, have you ever considered the difference, how you feel when you pour, uh, you know, a cup of coffee or a cup of tea in one of those paper cups in the back? You pour a cup of coffee or a cup of tea in that. What do you do when you're done with it? What do you, what do, you do if you, like, leave it sitting around somewhere? Probably just forget about it, like, ah, well, whatever, you know. Uh, you know, somebody will throw it away. No big deal. Somebody will pour it out. No big deal. It's, it's a paper cup, right? You don't care about it. You know, it gets a little bent. You know, it, it rips, whatever. Just toss it. Now, we don't feel that way about our Starbucks mug from Dubai or our Starbucks <laughs> mug from London or our Starbucks mug from St. Petersburg when, you know, that we're, we're taking back to the States to give to somebody. They, we value those things, right? What do you do with Starbucks mug? For one, you take care of them. For another thing, rarely do you put them like in the cabinet, okay? You put them like on some shelf to show all the countries you've been to, right? <laughs> At least that's what most people do. We had a few, we started a collection, it won't name names, but it, it rhymes with Zane. <laughs> Broke some of them, <laughs> no big deal. We started recollecting. Uh, I'm not bitter at all. Now we only had we only had like a couple, but we we, we did get get a few that were broken. But those are some of our our most precious mugs. I put coffee or tea in that. I, I won't even. I'm not even bringing that one up here. Like I have a mug downstairs. I'm not going to bring that up here because I'm afraid I might lose it. I'm afraid I might forget it, and it's precious to me. I'm just going to drink out of the paper one so I can throw those away. God views us like, like we look at a Starbucks mug or some, some you know, China set that you bought at the Renick, you know, or wherever. It's just like, this is gorgeous. This is valuable to me. This is precious. I'm going to put this on display. I'm going to take care of it. I'm going to keep it clean. I'm going to watch over it. I'm going to protect it. That's what God does for us. We are important and he wants to protect us. He wants to wash us clean and he wants to show us off to the world. Don't you just love walking around with some cool mug? And somebody says, hey, what's with that mug? That's pretty cool. You know, I got one from Egypt. And, uh, I, you know, people say, oh, is that, is that an Egypt mug? I always tell people, yeah, I got it last time I went to Egypt. I've never been to Egypt. <laughs> my wife, my wife went, went once, and she picked up a mug for me. Um, but, you know, it's, it's cool to have That's how God feels about us. He's like, have you seen my priest? Have you seen them? I washed them. I made them clean. I, I beautified them and I'm putting them on display. I want you to see it. That's how God feels about you. When you have Jesus Christ in your life, this is what God says. You're his child. You're his friend. You are more than a conqueror. You're chosen and loved. You're a citizen of his kingdom. You're redeemed. You're washed clean. You are a saint. You are a holy nation. You are a priest. You're a priest. It doesn't matter if you've been a believer for 25 years or 25 days or 25 minutes. You're a priest. What do priests do? For that, we're going to look back in the Old Testament just at this key verse, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 8. Um, to see what are some things that priests do. 
priests all came from the tribe of Levi. This is, this is kind of the Levitical, the priestly tribe was the tribe of Levi, of, of all the tribes of Israel. And uh, they had a, the special relationship with God. They had the special job that God had given them to take care of all the things that were related to worship. And listen to what he says in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 8. At this time, the Lord set apart the tribe of Levi. Listen, listen to these three things that he tells them to do. To carry the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. To carry the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. To stand before the Lord to minister. So they're ministering to God. And to pronounce blessings in His name to people. The Levites. This priestly tribe. They had three jobs. And I just want to look at those briefly. They were to carry the Ark. You know what the Ark is? You ever seen, uh, you ever seen the, the uh, what is it? Uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. You ever seen that? Okay. If you haven't, it's okay. Because it was like 25 years ago. I don't remember when that movie came out. Um, it's this golden box, right? It's this gold-plated box with a lid on it. And it has these angels that have been wings stretching over the top. And they would put this inside of the, the tabernacle or the temple uh, in, in the innermost room. And this is where God's presence would dwell. Do you remember the story when they were when they were uh, on in, in Exodus when they were traveling around and and, and God would, God would go before them in a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. They would follow when He started moving. They would pack up camp and they would follow along until that pillar of cloud or pillar of fire stopped, and then they would set up camp and they would set up the tabernacle, this tent of meeting they called it. And they would take the Ark of the Covenant in there and they would set it down and God's presence would come and dwell on this lid. The lid was the throne of God on earth. It was where his presence dwelt. It was this amazing thing. And the, the Levites got to carry the Ark. Can you imagine carrying something like that? Can you imagine... The very presence of God. You're carrying the thing that God's presence dwells on. I have trouble imagining it, honestly. It's, it's, it's so amazing for me to think about. That's a job that God has given us to do. We're to carry God's presence with us everywhere we go. When God... When we go throughout the day, we're to follow God's leadership. Wherever He leads us, whatever He wants us to do, when He tells us to stop, set up the tent of meeting, somebody needs to meet with God. You need to bring someone into the presence of God because you have Jesus Christ in you. You have God's Spirit in you. Set up a meeting. Let somebody meet with God. Carry His presence everywhere you go. That's what God has called us to do. Is that amazing? We're to carry his presence, whether it's to work, to school, maybe to a friend's house, to the store, wherever, wherever it is, walking down Nevsky, on the metro, carry God's presence with you everywhere you go. And when God shows us that if someone needs to meet with him, set up the tent, put the ark in there and bring them into the presence of God. Peter said, what, that we are living stones built into the spiritual house. We are living stones. We're part of this tent of meaning. We're part of the spiritual house where people meet with God. And everywhere we go becomes a place where people meet with God. Paul said we're ambassadors for Christ, right? We're ambassadors. We're, we're, we're representatives of God. We, we lead people into his presence. We go and represent him everywhere we go. As, as um, an international community, I think we kind of understand that, right? I know that that I'm a representative of America. It's, it's kind of, it's a lot of pressure, I'll tell you that, okay? Um, I, I think about that sometimes, that maybe somebody who, who has only seen America on TV, that's just sad, isn't it? And in the same, same way, you know, if you're Russian, you know that there's Americans who have only seen Russia on TV. It's just a sad representation sometimes. And I think that you know, when I come into the presence of somebody from another country, I think I am representing America to them. I may be trying to break down some, some stereotypes that they think about America. I, I may be the only America they ever see, 
and their opinion of America is going to be formed based on what they think of me. Wow, that's a lot of pressure. Like, I've got to get this right. Like, try not to mess it up. I'm representing my entire country right now. You ever feel that way when you travel somewhere? Yeah, hopefully you will now. Feel that pressure, okay? I just want you to sense that. Um, and, you know, it, it's my personal mission to educate Russians on where Arkansas is. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you know where Arkansas is, because I'm always sad because nobody knows. Okay, well, you got it. You're American. I hope you know where, where Arkansas is. But, like, I'll, I'll ask that to Russians. They're like, where are you from? I said, I'm from Arkansas. Okay. I'm like, do you know where Arkansas is? No. I'm like, it's a state in America near Texas. Texas. I hate doing that. Like, that's why I need to educate all Russians on where Arkansas is in relationship to something other than Texas. Because English movie night, we, we meet lots of Russians in English movie night, and and uh, I have three friends, they're all from Texas, and they all, oh, we're from Texas, we're from Texas, Texas, and if you're from Texas, God bless you, but I don't want to have to reference, um, you know, Arkansas as being from Texas, it's just embarrassing. Um, all right, so, you know, it, I, re I represent Arkansas, I represent the Razorbacks, that's our, that's our mascot in our state, you don't have to know that. I represent America, you represent something everywhere you go. But other than your country or your city or your family, you represent, above all else, you represent Jesus Christ. You represent God. Everywhere you go, you are a priest. People may never come to church. We have to take God's presence to them. We're representing God to them. What are they going to think about God by meeting Him through us? What are they going to experience through us? How are they going to experience God's presence through us? We carry his presence with us. The second thing is this. As priests, we minister to God. In the Bible, worship is never, ever about us. It's never for people. It's always for God. It's always about God. But we always tend to make it about us, don't we? Don't we? It's about my preferences. I don't like this music. You know, it's, it's too hot, it's too cold, I don't like this time, it's too early, it's too late, uh, you know, I don't like this coffee, I don't like this tea, you know, I don't like the way the preacher's dressed, he's boring, uh, he preached too long, you know, the singers were singing off key, there was too many songs, there was too few songs, whatever it is, we, we always have our preferences, right, we always have our opinions, our egos, it's always, we always tend to make it about us instead of about God. And he says it's not. It's not about even about our needs. It's not about our comfort. It's about him. Worship is always about God. Who are we praising? We're praising him. People need God. And they need to meet with him. And we carry his presence. And the Bible says that he is enthroned. It says this in, in Psalm 22, 3. I don't think I have this up there. But he is enthroned on the praises of his people. When we praise God, when we worship Him, when we minister to Him, when He is first and foremost in our minds, then His presence comes with that. We create a throne for Him. We're worshiping Him, and His presence will be there. And that's how people will come into the presence of God that need to hear Him, that need to know Him, that need to meet Him. When we're focused on Him, we have to have that first. If we're focused on us and worshiping us and thinking about our needs and our comfort, then we're not really ushering in the presence of God. We're not really carrying the presence of God. We're not ministering to him. And we're really not going to create the presence of God for anybody else either. We're missing the most basic thing. We invited a group uh, last year to come and minister here in Russia. Maybe some of you saw them. Uh, I think that they did visit our church once. It was a uh, Bruce... Uh, Crevier and his, a couple of his kids came. They ride unicycles. They do basketball shows. Incredibly talented. Just amazing uh, family. And a few of them came over and they were going to do some ministry at different places and come to a, a, a student camp that we were doing and all this great stuff. When they showed up though, what, what do they do? They do unicycles, basketballs. 
incredible tricks, like spinning all kinds of basketballs. This guy can spin two basketballs, one on top of the other. Two basketballs. I thought it was impossible. I saw a picture. I said, that's impossible. He does it like no problem. Um, they, they ride unicycles, like, you know, 15-foot unicycles, like huge unicycles. Amazing stuff. When he got here, his unicycles and his basketballs got hung up in customs. Bah, bah, bah. Classic, right? Customs would not release these things. And we had a show the very first day. And I'm like, he's like, what am I going to do? I'm like, I don't know. Like, I'll find you some basketballs. He goes, well, it's going to be hard to do a basketball unicycle show without any basketballs or unicycles. And I found them some basketballs for their first show, but they weren't their basketballs. They were like all, you know, misshapen and, and off. And they were trying to spin them and they were like all falling off. It was, it was terrible. They didn't have any unicycles at all. I was trying to like round up somebody with a, like a little unicycle, but it didn't, nothing worked out. They were missing the most basic thing for their unicycle basketball show. They didn't have any unicycles and basketballs. Luckily, he's a good talker and he has lots of jokes. So he was able he was able to make it work. But it just it was it, something important was missing. When we're not ministering to God, when we're not putting Him first, we're missing something that is very basic in our job as a priest. Something very basic in our worship. Is putting him, worshiping him, not us, worshiping him, not somebody else. Always putting him first. When we do that, he comes, he's enthroned on our praises, his presence is there, people meet with him, lives are changed. That's our goal. That's the calling that he's given us. That's our job as priests to carry his presence and to set up a throne for him so that other people can experience meeting with him and give him glory. The third thing is bless somebody. Bless somebody. Pronounce blessings on him. That's what priests do. They pronounce blessings. Um, what is a blessing? A blessing is this. It's when we declare the truth of God into somebody else's life. That's the basic definition of a blessing. When we declare the truth of God into somebody else's life, maybe we're telling them God's promises from Scripture. Maybe we're just speaking the truth of God's Word about uh, you know, something that, that, that God has done for us or something that, that God says He's going to do. And we're declaring that into their lives. When we let His love and His mercy overflow, the things that He's done for us, we let them overflow into somebody else's life. That's a blessing. God wants us to bless the word bless essentially means to make someone happy. It means to happiness, joy. And that comes when they meet God. He wants to bless his people. God wants to bless people and he wants to use you to do it. He wants to bless somebody through you as his priest, as his representative. As somebody that he has taken and changed, he wants that blessing to flow through you to the people around you. You're a priest. He wants to show love to those people that we see every day that are hurting. Those people that have questions, that have no hope, he wants to share that hope. He wants to share that answer. He wants to share Jesus Christ with them through you. He wants you to carry his presence. To the world so that people can meet him and so that people will be blessed by his presence imagine for a moment if every single believer did the work of a priest if every single believer here today even just in our congregation went out for the rest of the week carrying the presence of God Setting up meeting places for people to meet with God. Imagine that. Imagine if we let God bless people through us all week long. We made him our number one priority. What would change? What would be different at the end of next week if we did that? If we truly worshipped him. And helped others to worship him as well.
That's what God's called us to do. That's what will change the world. That's what a priest does. And what are we? A priest. Let's just say it one more time. What are we? Priest. Priest. I'm a priest. You're a priest. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ. You can hear Jesus calling us to be priests in his final command in Matthew 18 or Matthew 28, 19, and 20. This is what he says. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. That's the calling of a priest. That's the work of a priest. Let me let me just read it to you another way. Um, this is not the, an authorized version, but this is just just me. Go and bless everyone in the world with my truth. Make meeting places between me and the people, teaching them to put me first. And you will carry my presence. You will carry my presence with you wherever you go forever you're a priest um, you know, Alan mentioned bacon I can't I can't let that slip I, I feel like I have a bacon ministry sometimes I'm mm-hmm. trying to um, you know enlighten the world about the, the goodness of bacon and I, I say that jokingly but I do kind of uh, uh, have a bacon ministry sometimes when <laughs> My kids have visitors over and they like have a sleepover. Like the next morning I'm up early. I make sure that we've bought bacon. That I'm going to cook bacon like for our guests, you know. And I, 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 I make sure that it's, you know, it's a beautiful plate of bacon. I set it out on the, you know, for them to, to have some bacon. And if they don't like bacon, I force them to eat bacon anyway. Because everybody has to eat some bacon. Usually it's not a problem. But I want them to experience the goodness. If they haven't had the, the richness of bacon in their lives up to that point, I want them to experience it, right? And I, I do say that jokingly. It's actually just an excuse for me to cook bacon, um, which I honestly don't cook very often. Um, I just try to make people think I do. Um, I want to share that with people, but it doesn't even compare with what God's done for us, the richness of what He has done in my life. And I want to share that with people. When it comes to worship, I want people to experience that. When it comes to being in the presence of God, I want people to experience that. When it comes to having this passion just to glorify Him and just wanting to just to praise Him for what He's done, I want people to experience that. It's humbling to know that He has called me as a priest and given me this job. But I'm so thankful because it's an honor to get to carry his presence, to to get to set up meeting places for people, to get to create opportunities for worship. So this week, remember this, no matter what your title is, Mom, dad, maybe you have a title at your job, maybe you're a teacher, maybe you're a worker in some ministry, maybe you work, you know, in some other job title completely, maybe you're a student, whatever whatever it is, you know, sister, brother, whatever people call you, I want you to remember this. More than any of that, you are a priest if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. That's your first job. Set up a meeting for somebody this week. Let's pray. God, we thank you for worship. We thank you that you allow us to meet with you, to be in your presence, that you make us clean again, that you make us right, that you forgive us, that you purchase us, that you sacrifice for us so that we can be in your presence. That's how much you love us. Thank you for that. God, we want to give you glory. We pray that you would receive our praise, that you would receive our words, you would receive everything that's done today as an act of worship. We pray that you would be pleased with it, and we pray that it would continue all day today and tomorrow and for the entire week. 
Thank you for calling us. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to represent you. And we pray that you would empower us, work through us, and do something incredible in the lives of the people around us. God, I pray that you would work through this series, that you would work through just the things that we look at in your word, that your Holy Spirit would be among us and that we truly would worship and that we truly would understand worship a little better at the end of this and be a little bit more mindful of the things that you are doing in our lives. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, Lord.